course, might be a little more, might be a little less. This is the first dive of the Lu'uaia Hiki Kei Kualono Kai expedition. We are currently zooming around, or zooming up, I should say, um, unnamed Seamount Sea near the Shataka Seamount, which is just outside of the Apahana Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Also, if we could collect a rock sample soon, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yay. I don't know. I don't think we have any rocks here. <laughs> <laughs> At least two out there. Um, actually, why don't we... Um, I think we'll be okay. Are we doing rock and niskin at this place? Yes, please. Okay, so we'll do a niskin before we do the rock so that we can grab the rock. If we got to move, we can just move away. That sound okay? Sounds great. Okay. And you want to do it, you want to aim for about 2,500 meters? Yes. Okay. I want to quickly talk about our cruise objective, or our dive objectives. Our bio team. So we will be doing some sampling, both biological and geological. Um, we have a number of geologists on board that are very interested in the rocks. So we've been collecting quite a few rocks. Uh, because this seamount and seamount chain has unexplored, um, Learning a little bit more about the geology here is pretty important, but learning about the biology is also important. We are looking for any uh, species new to science, um, and also we have a few special requests for organisms that uh, some scientists are interested in. So collecting maybe a few sea cucumbers from shallower depths, and then um, looking at uh, bamboo corals. Uh, the group of bamboo corals is currently being studied and um, described. So we are going to take a look at some of those animals as we pass by. So we have a lot of interesting things hopefully to see and hopefully to collect as we make our way for, uh, up Niskin? the seamount. Yep. When you're ready on the winch. We got oh, there's another one of those little- We got 15 meters of vertical, so no big deal. Failing things. Oh, sure. Keep seeing these small white animals that keep swimming off screen. Hopefully we'll be able to see one close up sometime along this dive track. And Chris Fritz Bonk. asking. Looks like you have one, two, and five open. Can you confirm that back row, please? We, we have, have one, two, and five open, yes. Thank you. All right, you can come up on Delta now. Uh, sure. again. Sorry? Aaron Kemp, full extra super wide, please. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. So we are currently collecting so a, a Niskin water sample. Uh, we have one, two, and five. We're pulling this yes. tab, which is right. going to trigger a bottle that is open on both ends. And then after it's pulled, Good. both ends will snap shut. That's so we Niskin get two. a Niskin water two. sample from right. this location. And let's grab a rock here. That was zero, one, one. How about that one right by the slurp nose, slurp nozzle? A little round one, or? Whatever you can grab, I guess. As long as science is cool with it. Um, yeah. Uh, well, that's a big, a big one? boy. That's a big one. Do you want a big or small one? A big one's fine, if you guys can fit it. If we got room in the box, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's put it in starboard E. Starboard Echo. 
Oh, I'm okay. I'm getting I'm messing you right up. It's okay. Hey. Oops. Clunk. <laughs> I'm backing away. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. That might be it. Nice. Okay, get that in front of the camera and then come up on winch, please. Make sure you get some frame grabs. Okay, good there. That looks great. Okay, we'll do a little bit of operational stuff, then we'll give you a nice zoom in on it too. Sweet. So what's the significance of the paired sampling plan that you have to collect water and a rock from the same location? <clears throat> yeah, so... Can we Keep you going. Want me to keep the map? Yeah. When, only when you think about volcanology um, or igneous petrology, uh, when you have a magma that turns into a crystallized form, uh, you have uh, something called a partition coefficient, which uh, kind of tells you like how likely something is to go into the solid phase. And so, what we're That's hoping to good. do here okay. is to find a partition coefficient between, I'm specifically looking at cobalt in the seawater and cobalt in the crust, um, see if there's a partition coefficient oh, for them. And since these crusts and are you can made, ask for a zoom when you're ready. Uh, okay. um, go go ahead really and zoom in. It's a very lumpy rock. Yeah, they do that sometimes. I don't know if that'll fit in one of the small boxes. Would definitely fit in a big one. We're going for echo, right? We can yeah. go for echo, yeah. Okay. Oops. Chris Fritzen is asking for his students, and this is uh, both Megan and Coralie. You guys get a dual question here. Um, because of uh, how relatively barren this area is, um, how productive is the upper ocean in this area, and how old is the bottom here? Or is that one of our objectives to age the uh, floor? Sample level, please. Yeah, so I think one of our objectives is to date the age floor. Um, we are looking for, in addition to ferromanganese crust and water pairs, uh, we're looking to uh, find some fresh basalt samples, which we can use for isotope and dating, and I think specifically we're hoping to do argon-argon dating on them. So how old would you estimate you this good, good there. seamount chain to be? Right. I, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> it's really hard to, really turned around. to date <laughs> the seafloor just by guessing. <laughs> oh, that wasn't good. Um, so one of the things that uh, Bob was talking about earlier was about the plate tectonics and how you can see the seafloor age. And they do have a lot of models for that that are pretty good. But um, sometimes things can uh, move. Seamounts can move um, and not in relation to plate tectonics. So these seamounts that we're on right now, even though we're near Hawaii, were probably not formed any time near Hawaii was formed. Can you go, oh, actually, fine. Yeah, the theory is that they're probably much older, correct? Yep. And then on the Megan side of things, on the bio side, um, how productive is the upper ocean in this area? So, um, the area the of the, this please? ocean here isn't nearly as productive as um, some other areas uh, uh, like you would Delta, expect please. near the coasts yep. of continents or in the um, Arctic waters. So you're not getting large algal blooms at the surface that would then feed um, the deep ocean. So there isn't as much food getting to the deep sea here as you might see in other locations. So we considered this area of the ocean to be oligotrophic. Uh, sorry, consider it to be what? Oligotrophic. 
What does that mean? That means that not as much food is getting to is, is being produced at the surface. So there aren't as many nutrients at the surface for um, phytoplankton to yep. consume. So uh, phytoplankton is what's really driving the food production and food chain um, from the surface to yeah, the seafloor. Okay. And I got a little distracted by trying to get all this information about the rocks, but um, so the reason why I'm looking at the seawater is because unlike uh, volcanic rocks nice. that form, which is what the ocean crust is made out of, they form from volcanoes uh, all along the seafloor. Um, the mantle comes up and pushes everything to the side. Uh, and sedimentary rocks, which form from particles landing on top of each other and stacking and getting compressed or metamorphic rocks which is what happens when you take either a sedimentary or volcanic rock and you put it under extreme temperature and pressure and it changes the mineralogy of the rock those are how we normally get rocks but these rocks are special because they form from chemical reactions with the seawater so since they're created from the seawater we think that the composition of the seawater is going to have an effect on the composition of the rock. So we are testing that hypothesis. That's really interesting. So how long does it take for um, these types of rocks and crusts to form? Yeah, so why we can probably tell that the these seamounts are older than uh, other seamounts is because ferromanganese crust, average crusts uh, grow one to 10 millimeters per million years. So like, let's say these look pretty crusty to me. I'm gonna say maybe there'll be like a centimeter on some of them. That means that it took, you know, 10 million years for the, those to form. Uh, so you have to have the seamount before then. Seamount has to be over 10 million years old. That's a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> the Earth is super old, and we're only here for a blink of an eye, <laughs> if that. Yeah, I always love when geologists talk about time, because they'll be like, oh, it's so young, only 3 million years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is pretty young. <laughs> It's all relative. Well, we were talking about um, starfish eating coral. You know, it's like a multi-decade process for them all to... Right. We've got a really cool sponge here. This is a uh, sponge in the family Ferreidae, and I've also spotted um, a bamboo coral, and then there is a chrysogorgid coral coming up. Can we zoom on that coral pilot? Possibly. So I can spin around here. It looks like there might be an associate in the branches of this little coral. Yeah, go ahead and zoom there, please. So we're seeing a little bit more diversity as we're making our way up the slope of the seamount. So this is a Chrysogorgia, a type of golden coral. And in its branches, you can see a brittle star Normally we see squat lobsters in the branches of these corals, but this is really interesting that there's a brittle star here. Thank you. Why why do you say that they don't like to be in corals? They prefer to be on rock? Um no, we'll see brittle stars on corals quite often. It's just that I usually don't see that type of brittle star in that coral. Um usually it's the squat lobster that likes to be on that coral. Uh, the chrysogorgids are very sort of thin and fragile, um, and usually the brittle stars of that na of that type tend to be on sponges and more robust um, corals. But there's definitely uh, going to be a few more animals around than we, what we saw or earlier, and now that we're shallower, uh, we might be getting into an area where we might see a higher density and diversity of animals. Like we're about 2,500 meters-ish. Yep, 
We are currently at 2,483 meters. So I like how also our relativity in, uh, in depth and talking about what's deep and what's shallow um, also depends on who you're talking to. Um, some people will be like, oh, it's deep. It's deeper than 200 meters. And then other people will be like, oh, it's deep. We're looking at you know 6,000 meters. And then a lot of people who study, study trenches and they're like, well, no, deep is actually like 10,000 meters. I'd love to be on a 10,000 meter dive. Although the, the time it would take to get to the bottom would be... <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, that is a long descent. And ours is about 4,000, uh, 4,000, oh my gosh, about four hours. <laughs> to go almost 4,000 meters. Right. So question for you, Megan, from uh, Graham Sammamish, Washington. So that's, I'm from Washington State, hello. Can associates of corals possibly be beneficial to the coral? Could they defend the coral from predators? Absolutely. Um, a lot of these coral associates don't actually harm the corals that they're living on, um, but they can help remove large things that might get stuck in the coral's branches, um, keeping the coral clean. Um, they could be defending the coral from predators, uh, and, and there can be a lot of benefits to the coral in addition to the coral providing benefits to the animal that's associating with it. Um, corals provide habitat to a lot of different animals, especially our, our brittle stars, snake stars, uh, squat lobsters, um, feather stars, and those types of animals tend to enjoy finding spots on tops of corals and sponges. And that's because the, the corals and sponges allow these animals to get up off the seafloor and also are uh, refuge and provide uh, opportunity to gather more food. And is it possible for you to explain how most of our oxygen on land comes from the ocean? Just the question we have in the chat. Um, so the ocean is a very large expanse, and uh, the phytoplankton in the ocean uh, produce oxygen. So because they are plants, uh, they are you know taking in carbon dioxide and uh, using sunlight to produce oxygen, just like your trees on land. So the oceans actually do produce more oxygen than you know, our land plants will do. So yeah, the ocean actually breathes for us and provides us oxygen. And it also provides the oxygen uh, that is actually in dissolved in the ocean water as well. All right, we are getting to this sort of uh, local um, flat area. It's sort Plateau. of like a little pedestal, pinnacle, um, local high. And it's got a little bit of a flat top, which is probably why we're seeing this uh, sediment fields as opposed to some of that more consolidated substrate. Another question about life on the sea floor. Life here seems to run at a different speed than what we're accustomed to. How long does an average sponge individual live or a coral live? Um, that's kind of like two separate questions, right? Because like life for, you know, like a fish is slow. Then at the same time, a coral lives for, can live for a very long time. Yeah, a lot of these species live extremely long lives um, in comparison to our own. So we don't actually know how old a lot of these sponges are. It's not easy to date them. Um, but some of the corals that we were able to collect from the deep sea have been dated to ages over 2,000 years old. So 
So that puts them on the scales of like redwood trees in terms of age. And that seems very typical for a lot of these animals. A lot of uh, black corals have been found to grow that um, and have that long lifespan. Uh, and then also uh, the gold coral, which is uh, part of the community here in Hawaii uh, at shallower depths, um, have been dated to well over 2,000 years old. I love the wavy pattern in the sediment there. Yeah, the currents. Yeah, and when you have good currents, uh, that brings more food, and corals are much happier when there's a lot of food around. And you'll notice, like, we have this one boulder, and there are there's a wonderful large bamboo coral on it. So the corals will take advantage of these nice substrates whenever they can. And we, we still don't really know exactly how they find and settle on these locations that they do, but it's one of those areas of interest for a lot of deep sea scientists is how do corals and sponges get to where they are and start growing? Are there settlement cues that occur that Tell them, oh, this is a good spot. Um, currents will bring larvae to different locations. So if a location has a good current flow, that could be a, a way that these animals are getting to these good areas and can be successful. I'm so curious as to what that lone blob is there. Yeah, there might be a rock there. Yeah. You know, of course, I'm hoping that it's some magnificent creature, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, bio team, what are the dissolved oxygen levels like at this depth? Well, you've got the graph up. Yeah. Seems to have leveled out. Yep. 80 something. So those of you, you at home, you can actually check out our live feeds of data on our uh, Grafana app. So we are looking at the science dive data. Yeah, so if you go to nautiluslive.org um, on the right side where it says live data you just click more data and that takes you to our real-time data so it looks like uh, oxygen concentration is around 105 micromoles per liter when we were down deeper the oxygen concentration was higher and that's likely because of the water mass difference between that that deep um, area where we launched this morning and our current depth We kind of talked about this a little bit, or rather how difficult it is uh, in terms of sponges, but how do you determine the age of sponges and corals? What is the process? So to determine the age of a coral, we would like to measure the base of the coral. So you actually, we don't usually collect a whole entire colony um, because that would ultimately kill that whole entire colony. So usually when we make a collection, we'll collect just a few branches so that we can make an identification. But in order to age a coral, uh, you need the thickest part of that coral, and that's gonna be the base where it attaches to the rock. Um, and you can use different techniques for aging it, but usually uh, carbon dating is a good way to uh, measure the age of those corals. So not quite at the top top i guess it's off to the right let's have a look we're, we're pretty the far star. from the top top yet beg your pardon we're pretty far from the top top that was just that little knoll oh i gotcha i got gotcha. you i'm zooming out that. and you can get okay. a better no perspective. i'm sorry yeah you're right can you zoom in on the star please roger that and can Trash. star and can combo yes that's a 
Campbell's chicken noodle soup. No, it's canned starfish. Looks like it was never used. Is the other one at the other end open? <laughs> Is this a... Well, maybe it's still good. That yeah. star's munching that coral. Certainly. Poor little young coral. Coral. Died too young. Oh, poor Tragedy. coral. Yeah, these, uh, these uh, sea stars, they do enjoy eating uh, bamboo corals. So we often see them climbing in the branches and consuming that coral. Nothing else to eat around here. <laughs> I guess they'll eat what you can, right? Too bad they couldn't eat the can of soup. Yeah. We were just talking about the summit. We have a question about how far are we from the summit? I don't think we've seen a fly trap in ME yet this, uh, this watch. I'll, like, I'll give you an estimate in a second. Ooh, what's that? Let's zoom in on this thing, please. Uh, probably about two and a half kilometers to the summit. Yep. Yeah, so this is a done dead sponge stalk. And then we have a Venus flytrap anemone that has uh, made its home on top of it. So this anemone is called Actinus scyphia. Cool. They're quite common here at these depths. Uh, we're also seeing some primnoa corals, some more of those from Mulagorgia. Uh, Chrysogorgic corals. Yep. Getting wow. to be a much denser community here. Yeah. This one keeps Another going. Another very you? large, unbranched bamboo coral. Yeah. Are you going to go to the highest spot here? That would be interesting. It's off to your right. a caliphacus sponge that's that little white circle off to the right uh on the stock we have time to have a look all right we're gonna zoom into the sponge all right well we have picked up some in the past oh and then you zoom the sponge one of our please and the red thing behind fishes. it but in some cases this is this chonicops coloratus it's a like type of can. angler fish. Oh, they're so cute. Fish I like those. Uh, family. Aww. I have cute faces. Cute little guy. Yeah. Does it have I don't think it has eyes. Does it? It does have it eyes. It does. It does. It's uh, lower right. Those little blue things. Aww. It's got one eye. It's so cute. Oh, it's got one on the other side. Yeah, they're my favorite. They're just they, so yeah, adorable. Yeah, they sort of like they walk around. Oh, yeah. What's that white thing in the middle of his head? That's his brain. That's his lure. <laughs> ah. So they can actually move that. Uh, back and forth. You zoom in on them because you, it's, it's really, they're cute. They look like they have tattooed yeah. face. Yeah. Aw. Cool. They're transparent. You can, some of them, you can see their heart beating. I mean, okay. it's really. Okay, oh, come yeah. wide, please. Now, that's I what move. I saw. So oh, that yeah, a that's a right, dead right. sponge stock. Mystery solved. What was the name of that little fish? Chonicops coloratus. Is that named because it was first found in Colorado? <laughs> no, it's color. Uh. Otis. <laughs> and we just had a question that we were sort of talking about, about um, picking up litter on the seafloor, what we do and do not pick up, or why we do or do not pick it up. In some cases, I mean, like a shipwreck becomes a habitat. In fact, they, in some areas, they literally sink them to create habitats, particularly on flat, uh, sandy bottoms where there's no place to hide. Here, there's plenty of places to hide. If you're little. <laughs> yep. You yeah, there's little tiny. nooks and crannies. You have to be tiny to hide here. When we dove on the Lusitania, there were so many one. Pollock that we had to turn our lights off, mm -hmm. drive on sonar, 
and turn them on, and you had about 10, 15 seconds before you were obliterated by Pollock. And you couldn't <laughs> see. There's another one of them down there, and that'll. They're yeah. everywhere. Yeah, little guys. Yeah, they're quite common, yeah. but uh, they are super cute, so it's hard not to take a look at them when we do see them. Here I am. I'm stopped. Ish. Yeah, it's right under your porch. One more. Back no. up a yeah, we'll do it later. Yeah. Weird. Shortly, we'll be heading towards waypoint seven, so it's going to be a heading change. We're going to be our bearing change probably to about two eight five. We might have a little bit of a, a divot, but I don't think it'll be anything crazy. Before Sounds we good. head back up slope. Roger. Yeah, there's a sort of you can see a ridge line connecting them where there's less uh, contours. Well, it's kind of localized, right? Because there's a like that's the summit. I feel like there's just a little bit of a valley. Yeah. Some it's and then we're gonna go back up. To take it's just there's like a valley. Like this would be the trajectory if we were following if you the ridge. Go off this way. You, it, you can't go down right. slope. I mean, based on semi reality. <laughs> we can Medium take semi reality. We take what we can get. There you are. Now, has anyone memorized the name of this expedition in Hawaii? Yes, I have had to say it a lot. <laughs> the Lu'u'a'ea Hiki Ke Kualono Kai Expedition. I've memorized all four of them. This is three out of a set of, number three out of a set of four. Bridge nav. Can we get a five zero meter step bearing to eight five? Do you want to? Okay. It's going to be maybe like 50 meters change over the progress of like 300 meters. Okay. Okay. Bridge and Ab, can we make that a uh, 200 meter step? 285? Do you want the transfer speed up? All right, all right. Bridge Navin, can we increase transfer transfer speed to zero point five knots? Thank you.
Looks like we're coming up on a bit of a valley here. Yeah, we're going to go a little downhill. We're going to try and make it go as fast as possible. But just because we're in a hurry to get to the summit, or is there... What was that? Is that because we're in a hurry to get to the summit, or is there an ROV reason? I don't really know. Because we suspect it won't be very thrilling, but ah. if anything changes, we'll <laughs> slow it down. Gotcha, gotcha. Like, I don't know, you know, ROV, ROV stuff, you know, how far away, for what determines how far away you are from the seafloor, whether you try to fly as close as possible, or I know nothing of these things. I generally just pick a random thing to do and just do that. <laughs> uh, downhill, because the cameras are on the front, and I don't want to drag the back end. Uh, it looks like we're a lot farther away from the slope, which is why we generally plan all our dives starting deep and going shallow. It's really hard to get imagery or samples or anything on, uh, on a downslope. Excellent. One for Megan. Um, some of the specks that are floating by uh, the commenter assumed were marine snow, but they appear to swim. Is that an artifact of the light, or are some of those specks alive? Yes, some of those specks are alive. So um, it's, they're likely copepods um, that you're seeing, or maybe some amphipods. Um, those are small crustaceans um, that will swim in the water column. And so uh, they feed upon marine snow. Um, they usually just spend their entire lives in this water column. And uh, they, they sometimes will avoid the ROV because uh, it's big and scary. Um, copepods are really quite fascinating creatures. They have an escape response um, when disturbed where they can actually zoom quite quickly away uh, from any sort of thing that might have disturbed them. So it's a good way to get away from a predator. Looks like there are a couple of splashes in the specs as well. Here and there. It's all wrinkled. Oh, they're delicious. They're, she's talking about the rocks. They're just delicious looking. I was assuming it was the marine snow, but you know, to each their own. Depends on uh, what kind of animal you are, I guess. We have time for an Argus question. I believe whoever said that was not on microphone, but um, how much does Argus typically move up and down from the movement of the ship during a level traverse? The camera seems to bounce up and down quite a bit. Yeah, so that kind of depends on the conditions on the surface. Argus is basically a big weight that's connected to the ship under a, on a cable that's under high tension. Um, Argus is about 3,500 pounds negatively buoyant. So if the ship is heaving up and down by say two meters, kind of like we're doing now approximately, um, Argus will be heaving up and down by that same amount. Um, yeah, if it increases too much, the cable will be under too much tension and that, that can be a problem. So we keep an eye on all these, all those sorts of things.
got a got a few questions along the way about push cores. I don't think there are any of our goals are to take push cores on this dive, is it? Or? We have five push cores. Question, are we interested in sediment ripples in this dive orally? You want to explain what you're interested in? What was that? It, this is asking if we're interested in ripples in the sediment this dive, but I thought you could explain what we are interested in geologically. Uh, yeah, so we're not super interested in the ripples in the sediment. Um, we're mostly concerned with the rocks underneath the sediment. Like we have an Argus fan in West, West Michigan. Is Argus being weighted that way intended to allow her to move freely? Um, can she repeat? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, she couldn't quite hear you. Oh, whoops. Oh yeah, so we've got an Argus fan in West Michigan. Is Argus being weighted that way intended to allow her to move more freely? Yeah, so... Hmm. Um, I mean, the, her Argus does decouple the motion of the ship from Herc. I don't... I don't know. What do you? Yeah. Let's go with yes. <laughs> Looks like there's another Venus flytrap in enemy. In the lower left hand corner. Megan, do you have any uh, predictions as to what we might be expecting to see on these unexplored seamounts as far as uh, compared to the biodiversity that we saw in, on the previous seamount that they explored? Um, so, I, I mean, as we go up on this slope, uh, the community will change a little bit. You'll probably see a little bit more corals as we get shallower. Um, and. But what we see is going to be really dependent on what the substrate's like. 
So as we see more hard substrate, So as we see more hard substrate, we'll, we'll be seeing more corals and sponges. Uh, right now, I see a Caliphacus sponge, and there are um, primnoa corals, uh, bamboo whip corals. And if we zoomed into the surface, we'd probably even see even more animals. So a lot of these animals that we're seeing right now are all um, basically just sort of white color. So they blend in a little bit with uh, the background of uh, sort of lightly dusted um, crusts on the seafloor. So we just have some sediment pockets um, along with, you know, our hard substrate. And as we move up, we're likely going to see higher density communities. Um, compared to earlier in our watch, uh, when we first got here, there weren't that many animals. Um, but now I'm seeing quite a few bamboo corals just in this view. One, two, three, four, five, six of them. And we've got this cool new tool, the Telestrator, which will sort of show you where these animals are. <laughs> so those are so our bamboo corals. <laughs> it's my most favorite thing. I think you missed some small ones in there. Oh yeah, there's even more. So like the more you look, there's actually even more stuff. Uh, when I actually rewatch this video to annotate it, uh, make notes about um, all the animals that we're seeing and their identifications. It often takes a long time just because as you look at a scene more, you see more things and there's more things to write down. You'll be the annotator for this video? Uh, it's likely. How long does it take you to annotate a video versus how long the video actually is? Um, it depends on how dense the community is. Uh, but in general, it usually takes four times as long uh, than what the actual video is. That's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Can we check out this sponge? Probably not. This is okay. why downhill is so lame. But oh. I can, we might have time for me to just loop around and check it. Yeah. Uh, see. So if this dive is 24 hours, it takes you four times Ooh. as long. So that's four days, and you're not working on this 24 hours a day, I'm assuming. You have to sleep, right? Right, yeah, I do sleep um, occasionally. <laughs> you know, um, I like to stop for meal times, you know, just to fuel my annotation process. Food is important. So it's going to take you a couple weeks just to do, or maybe, you know, a week or two just to do one dive, basically. Right, yeah, a 24-hour dive does take a very long time to annotate. So this is a fun sponge. Uh, this is a bolosoma sponge. It's a type of glass sponge. And this one is species B. So we don't actually have a description of the sponge yet. Um, there were a couple that have been collected uh, and they are currently being described. It looks like there's an associate on the stock of that sponge, but I don't think we're gonna have time to take a look at it. Uh, might have been a, a polychaete or a bristle worm. Thanks, pilot. That was really cool. Yeah, you bet. I have a question here about how uh, plankton and what the amount of plankton or if they were experiencing any um, plankton death in the area can affect life at this depth. So... Um, anything that is living here is, is like pretty much fair game to be food for other animals. So um, plankton in the water column will be eaten by other animals, and those animals will be eaten, eaten by other animals. That's basically how the food web works uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and the food webs in the deep sea are, are no, no different. So 
small things get eaten by larger things, and anything that dies gets eaten. So even when we have, uh, say, a large animal that might die and sink to the seafloor, you'll have animals from all over, scavengers, um, to come and, and consume that organic material that's available. Uh, and especially uh, for large things, these animals have to opportunistically find their food. It's not just going to be given to them. Uh, they're going to eat as much as they can, as quickly as they can, because there's no knowing where and when your next meal might be. And actually, as um, dive lead, I can ask you this question. Um, if we found just an amazing organism, like they're asking about a big fin squid, uh, would we divert our current mission to go observe that? Or would we stick to our mission objective? Um, obviously, if we see something really cool, we're going to uh, spend some time to observe uh, an animal, something maybe like a, a squid probably won't stick around for us to look at it for too long. Um, they usually will go their own way and then we will continue along on our dive track. But our mission here is to really explore this area. So any new and novel findings are worth our time to stop and take a look at. We're not doing any sort of um, really regimented transecting um, where we need to stay in uh, on a straight line moving ahead for uh, sort of a quantitative analysis. So we wouldn't put the ship at all, all speed ahead and chase after a squid then? Uh, it might not be possible. So the ROV can't actually move that fast. Squid will definitely outswim swim us. Um, the ship is limited on how fast it can go. Uh, to safely uh, move the maneuver the vehicle. Actually, that's a good question. How fast can the ROVs go max speed? Uh, probably straight ahead. I think her can get up to maybe two knots. But if there's any variation from straight ahead, the capabilities drop off a lot. Maybe a knot, just shy of a knot sideways or backwards. And... Yeah, it really depends on which way we're going. So that squid is definitely going to get away. I agree. So what's our typical moving speed? Uh, usually about 0.3 knots. It looks like something has swum its way along the sediment there. Do you want... Uh or I guess to settle out at all before we start heading up slope. Oh, We're pretty drug bad now. Age old question. Let's do it. Yeah, let's, let's settle out a bit. Okay, I'm gonna let it hold there then. Okay. Hopefully we can get it going again. Yeah, hopefully. Or we could do a uh, point one knot transfer speed, fifty meter move or something like that. Okay. Do you want to keep some momentum up? Okay. Cool. I do that. So right now we're in sort of a saddle area between um, our sort of local high and uh, moving, continuing upslope <coughs> on the seamount. So that's probably why we're seeing the nodules Bridge sort of nodule field. Can we get a uh, two zero meter move, two eight five, and reduce transfer speed to zero point one knots? Thank you.
question, is there any chance of getting closer to the nodules? Any chance of what? Getting closer to the nodules. With the ROV? Yeah, we, I mean, were, sure, we were closer we can, to the nodules a little bit ago. We can smash them. <laughs> Is that close enough for you? Hmm. Well. Is that hard? It's not kicking up at all? Hard to say. I don't know where I hit. Uh -huh. Might have been the back. Hopefully you have appeased the nodule fan. Are we going 285? Uh, that's what we're trying to go. Nice. I'll try to do it too. We're flatten out of bed at least so I can zip ahead, I guess. C pen, possibly, maybe C pen. Or is it not at all that? Spongy. Spongy. Maybe. Okay, zoom in on this non C that's, pen, please. That is a sponge. That is a sponge. That is not a C pen. Sponge. Cool. Okay, thanks. Bridge and Ave, another two zero meters, two eight five, zero point one. So yesterday we were talking a little bit about uh, Argus getting kind of laid back from the ship, and that's if you can see High Pack or Rav Nav right now, that's that's what's going on. So Argus is. Oh, like a hundred plus meters away from the stern of the vessel. Um, so we kind of have to wait for it to come back underneath the vessel before we start moving up slope. Do you have any idea why we call it Ravnav, but we don't call it Rav anywhere else? Why do we call it Ravnav instead of ROV Nav? just comes out of my mouth easier. Yeah, me too. But <laughs> you could say the same about calling it a ROV instead of an ROV. But I would never do I that. I would never call it a ROV. I know. You would be so angry. I'd be so angry about it. <laughs> There'd be Being. some division in the front row. You'd stop yeah, talking to me. Oh, you're calling it a ROV. That's not okay. <laughs> but we call it a ROV now. Why do we do that? I don't know if I could. We could change the name completely, but it would like, never be yeah. ROV now. Yeah, I don't think it'll ever be ROV now. Okay, you want me to call it NAV G? No, I don't. I call it Rob Nav too. It's hard to break a habit, Trevor. It is, yeah. Rocks. We got rocks. Look at this. There's a rock. Right where we're going up slope. That's amazing. What a rush. When semi reality meets reality. <laughs> These look like uh, pillows, so, like lava forms. Really interesting thing about how these volcanoes are formed um, and the way the lava flows underwater. Um, they f Sometimes the flow will form these like pillow-like structures. Yeah, so um, how you get those structures is pretty cool. Um, so obviously magma is pretty hot. Um, really high temperatures, thousands of degrees of Celsius. And then you have at the bottom of the ocean, it's super cold. It's like around one degree Celsius. And so when the hot magma touches the water, it immediately, we call it quenching, but it immediately cools. And when you get the pillows, what happens is it cools all on the top, but if the lava is flowing really fast, it pushes through and creates kind of these tubes 